You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really special guest. Uh, he was fishing both days of the KBF trail, uh, and he actually uh, came up roses on day two. He had a pretty good smile on his face. Then he has a bigger one now after dropping a <laughs> second place finish in the KBF on the tidal Potomac River. Josh, how are you doing tonight, bud? Uh, Thomas, I'm doing uh, phenomenal. Thank you for asking. I I I'm just stoked to be on the show with you, man. I'm really glad I was able to get you on here. And thanks again come, for coming out to the Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, I, I don't even know what we call it. The Kayak Pimped Out Show or something like that. Something like that, yeah. What, um, and you probably told this story a thousand times, but like, how did you get into this crazy kayak sport? Uh, okay, so uh, I was traditionally a bass boat, like tournament angler, mostly a co-angler, you know. Um, and I did, I did well in some tournaments. Uh, you know, I was also part of Army Bass Anglers and went and did force on force on WFN and all that good stuff. Um, and when I moved out here to Maryland, uh, I had somebody say, hey, we're having this Heroes on the Water event for disabled veterans like yourself, uh, but we want you to come out and be a guide. And I said, dude, I don't know anything about kayaks, like except for they're the ones that, that paddle between me and the bank when I'm on the boat and I'm trying to catch fish, you know? Uh, and, uh, and he said, dude, just, you can fish. We want you to come out and help these other folks. You know, they're, they're worse off than you condition wise, you know, come help out. And I said, hell yeah, let's go. So the next day I went out to Dick's Sporting Goods, bought a little, like, uh, with the old town trip angler sit in little 10 foot deal. Right. And I bought a Scotty rod holder and I plopped it right down in the very front of the cockpit. And I was like, I got a paddle and a, and a vest and I said, I'm ready to go. I go out there, have a great time, smash some good fish, get some other veterans on fish, and you know, it's just a great day. And uh get back to the ramp and the same guy comes up to me and says, Hey man, he goes, I know you came from fishing tournaments. We have this series called Mid Atlantic Ga Kayak Bass Fishing. Um, we have a tournament next weekend. I'll, if you want, come on out. And I was like, Cool, it sounds interesting, you know. The whole tournament in a kayak, why not? And I get out there and my mind is absolutely blown. Uh, I see, you know, I, I see other boats that are rigged just like mine, you know, and, uh, the guys with the floppy hats and all that, you know, and then I see these like tricked out Jacksons and Hobies and old towns and I'm just like blown away, right? They've got all these graphs. I mean, it's everything you'd have on a bass boat compacted down. And so, uh, I competed that first year in, in that little, you know, 10 foot uh, old town. And, uh, I hated that, you know, every time I got out of the kayak, my back hurt and everything else. And so I, I went to, uh. A local dealer out here and I, I picked up, they had a, a Jackson big tune on clearance. And, um, I went down there and I said, I called the guy, I said, Hey, Jim, I said, my name is Josh Evans. Uh, you still have that big tuna? And he said, Yeah. I said, All right. Well, I'm going to come buy it today and then I'm going to go win a tournament in it tomorrow. All right. This is the, this is the start of the next MEKBF season, right? That's some big energy there. <laughs> yeah. I, dude, I was, I was hype, man. I was super excited. New boat, you know, new season and everything else. Um, Went out and I bought it from him and, you know, he's kind of looking at me like, who the hell are you, you know? And I'm like, you know, watch. So I go out there the next day and uh, February, right? February, Lake Anna's hot side, right? Um, crazy day. I mean, after every cast, you'd have to dip your rod in the water to get the ice off the guides. You know, sub, sub, uh, sub freezing temperatures in the air. The water was 40 degrees, I believe. Um and uh, I end up out by one of the dikes, way out there, right? And I need one more fish. I, I catch it, and I'm like, you know, and looking at the leaderboard, I'm like, I have the winning bag. That's I can't believe it. I'm on the winning fish right now. I, I have the winning bag. I stand up uh, to to relieve myself, and when I sit back down, I ha I didn't know my kayak well, and I actually had not strapped down the the uh, the base of the seat properly, and the seat pops up like this. And I flip back into the water. Oh, my gosh. Right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, back then I didn't know anything about the proper gear, you know. So, like, I had layers of, of lots of heavy stuff on and my vest on. And I kept popping up like a bobber. And I'd be like, help. I'd yell because there was other guys kind of somewhere in the proximity, you know. And um, the boat is flipped over. The rear hatch is open. So, it's filling up with water, right. And, um, I'm just, I'm freaking out. I'm seeing my life flash for my eyes. My buddies come over. They fished me out. It was, uh, Sean Mock and Jim Dutt from Smalley Sticks Rods, uh, that were there. 
they helped fish me out and I dragged my kayak up on the dike, dumped all the water out and then sat there shivering, like in shock, you know? Um, and Sean, I'm like, dude, I don't have my dry bag. It's in my car. Cause we had to move launches and all this other stuff. And Sean, who's like half my size is like, well, I've got like a, he's a, a former Marine. He goes, I got a, a medium shirt and some pants. I said, well, the pants definitely fit in, but I'm going to squeeze into that medium. And I'm like, you know, three, two, three X guy. And uh, so I put that little baby tee on, boy, and, and that kept me a little bit warm. And uh, paddling, paddling back, you know, the the 45 minute paddle back to the launch. This is before I had a motor or anything, you know. I called tournament director Matt Baden, uh, who's the founder of MAKBF, and I said, "Hey, man, don't give away any money. I'm gonna be late, but I've got the winning fish." And I go there, and sure enough, man, uh, I won. Um, spent half the money replacing all the gear I lost. I mean, I, it's painful to even think about still. Uh, and then the other, I gave a couple hundred bucks to Sean and Jim and like, you know, for that, saving your life. <laughs> yeah. Th- thanks for not letting me turn into a bobbing pop. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, that was, that's how I got into kayak fishing, man. What kind of boat did you own before you got into it? I never owned one. So that's the thing. Uh, hmm. like I said, I always fished as a co. Oh, okay. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And when, when I won a couple of tournaments, I was, I think the, the, the last tournament that I had won was like, you know, the Real American Heroes Foundation, how they had their tournaments for the wounded oh, veterans. Wow. Yeah, that's a blast. Yeah. Point. Yeah. So uh, I went out with uh, uh, <laughs> Calvin Hunter, Catfish Hunter. He's a, he's a Bass Pro guy down uh, down by on the James. And I uh, went out with him and we, we won first place. Hmm. And um, I had that, you know, I won a big old TV and a bunch of stuff. And I went home that night with my wife and I said, Rita, I got to buy a bass boat. Like, I want to take... <laughs> I want to take this serious, right? And she's like, "Have you looked at the prices?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, like it doesn't have to be super expensive." She goes, she starts listing off, you know, the upkeep, the insurance, all the things that, you know, uh eventually would become my reason for lo- you know, loving mm-hmm. kayaks and staying in kayaks. Um so it wasn't in the cards and you know, then that series of events happened with Heroes on the Water and um MAKBF and I just fell in love, man. That, that's fascinating, though, that you went the co-angler route, because a, a lot of people get torn on doing that. Like, should they go straight into getting a kayak or a boat and being in control of your own destiny, so right. to speak, versus being a co? How did you even get into co-angling? Uh, you know, so I grew up, I grew up, uh, not to get too deep into it, but uh, I grew up out in Cali with my dad. You know, he had a center, center console Klamath, like 19, 20-foot aluminum boat, and we'd go out in the ocean and fish, you know, uh, all the channel islands and everything in california and, uh, so i grew up saltwater fishing i didn't you know i didn't yeah, yeah yeah that's how i grew up i i used to like when i was a kid i would go out on they call them cattle boats like the big party boats of like 100 plus people you know and i'd oh, oh. i'd go out there I'd, I'd you know act as a deckhand or i'd clean up the boat on the way in and i'd get to fish for free all day and so that's how i grew up right um that's cool so dude wow <laughs> I, I never really was into freshwater fishing What's up? I said, that's cool. Yeah, man. Like that, that's how I grew up, you know, is like that and like fishing for, for bay bass and calico bass in Newport Harbor, just walking around with a little lightweight spinning rod. Just like, that's how I found my love for fishing, dude. Um, my dad, let me, it's just a real quick story. I know we got a lot. Hey, 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 we can go um, 10 hours. We can go 10 hours if you want to go for it. What? I mean, I'm, I'm totally down. Um, when I was about three years old, that's when I started fishing, right? I'm 44 now. And my pops, he would tell me the night before, Hey boy, we're going to go fishing in the morning. Go put some Nestle, a scoop of Nestle chocolate in each one of our coffee cups. Right. And then, you know, I wouldn't be able to sleep the whole night because I'd be all jacked up like, yo, we're going fishing. Da, 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 da. Right. This is even before the boat. So like we had this, I'll tell you. So we'd go, we wake up the next morning. I'd be all hyped and tired because I didn't sleep. We'd go to 7-Eleven and, and, and get some coffee, mix that chocolate in, and boom, we were ready to go, right? Uh, we'd get out there, and there's this little poorly lit 24-hour dock that's on Newport Harbor, one little light, right? And we'd get there, and we'd roll the tackle boxes and bring the rods and everything. We'd get down there, and, and while my dad was cutting bait, he'd say, all right, start tying up the rods. And I'd tie up all the rods, right? He'd say, but don't tie a hook on that one, right? Or if I did, he'd just cut the hook off. He'd say, all right. Before you're allowed to fish, you have to start casting. There's a buoy that was like 100 yards out or some craziness, right? Wow. He'd be like, I want you to cast that sinker at that buoy. And you're going to cast that sinker until you hit it or you're not going to fish, right? And uh, I was like this, mother. you know what I mean? Like I was mad <laughs> uh, every time I'd get mad because I, I hated it, right? 
But it got to the point where, you know, we'd go out on these trips and I would hit it first or second cast every time. And uh, then it got to the point where he's like, all right, you're good. You're, you're just going to fish now, you know, because he wanted me, he wanted me to understand the fundamentals and the work behind it. You know, it's relaxation, but if you work hard at your craft, any craft is what he used to tell me, you're going to be better at it. You know, you're, you're not, you're not ever going to hundred percent perfect it because something's always going to change. There's always going to be a variable, but the more you practice something that you love, the better you're going to get at it. And, uh, and I, and I, you know, he kind of demonstrated it with that really. And and those skills are so transferable to every type of sport or discipline out there that you do. And ha- have you had a chance to do saltwater fishing on the East Coast? Because I guess my next question is, is it comparable to the West Coast? Because you're talking about thousands of feet of water, kelp beds, you know, 20 right. foot great white sharks. Like what, what <laughs> is that like out there? Uh, it's a different world, man. Uh, mm-hmm. I've only been, I've only fished in the salt once since I've been in Maryland. Um, and it was all right, you know, but you know, okay. Simple example. If you hear sheep's head out here, you think that little, you know, thing that looks like a freaking, almost like a tilapia, right? Like a kind of a disc shaped funky thing that hangs around the pilings on big bridges out in California. If you look at a California sheep head, it is this big, nasty tooth hermaphrodite fish. Like it is night and day. That's California fishing versus East Coast fishing in a nutshell. Oh my God, this thing looks that right there. Holy Lord, this thing is massive, dude. Yeah, they they get big, and they, so they're one of the only fish that um, they all start out one sex, and if there's not enough of the other opposite sex, then they they're hermaphrodites. They actually turn to the other sex so they can reproduce. Do they do they taste good? Do you eat them, or are they just they're, they're phenomenal? No, they're phenomenal, dude. They they live down in the in the rocks and shit or stuff like uh you know, like lingcods and all that. They all kind of hang out in the same type of, uh, you know, habitat. That is crazy. So yeah, if you're growing up doing this heavy tackle, bottom bouncing, I'm assuming when was your first taste of catching, you know, this little green fish that we catch in the river? Right. Um, actually my, uh, my stepdad, Brandy Burke, he, uh, he was, he's been around since I was a little kid too. So he's my other dad really. And, um, uh, he used to take me freshwater fishing. You know, we'd go camp out at this place called Canyon Lake in Riverside, California. And, uh, he gave me my first Rapala's little two inch gold joint, you know, gold and black. And he's like, go throw that over there. The sun's going down. You'll get something. And I'm, you know, looking at him like, oh, okay. Uh, so I would. And then I caught my first bass on it. And I was, I was like, okay, this is actually kind of cool. You actually have to put some effort into it, not just set your pole down and, you know, go do whatever. Um, so that got me kind of really like, this is fun. This is great. So kind of simultaneously learning freshwater fish and fishing and learning artificial baits, you know, kind of that same passion kind of triggered at the same time. Uh, when I was probably like 10 or 11, I'd say maybe, maybe a little younger. Um, and just started going for their side, so you know, I became pretty well versed in, in a lot of different types of fishing, uh, fresh and salt. Um, and, and, you know, that's when you start really, that passion and that kind of drive to learn more and understand it and be better kind of just kept persisting, you know? Um, yeah. No, that that's, that's so cool because like there is so many different types. We do get so <laughs> narrow minded in this industry of it always has to be like a bass. We're chasing a bass, whether it's a kayak or a hundred thousand dollar Skeeter right. boat or something, but then it's like there's striper. There's saltwater trout, there's redfish, you know, there's California sheep. Like there's so many different ways that you can get hooked on fishing. Um, not just, just, you know, fishing the tournaments, but so from there you get over here, what did you start being a co-angler? Uh, actually in Texas, uh, when I was stationed at Fort hood, um, it was another veteran event. Actually, uh, I started doing that. Um, really liked it, you know, uh, again, couldn't afford a boat, but I got to see, the tournament, I guess the tournament scene or kind of how tournaments happen. Cause you'd only see it on like the Bassmaster class or watching, you know, Hank Williams or something on TV, you know, you, you, or Hank Parker. I mean, you know, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know, you know, the ins and outs of a tournament unless you fished one. And so I started doing that and, uh, I mean, I wasn't super successful at it and like that, you know, no, I wasn't like, ultra competitive as far as like all the BFLs and all the, you know, the big opens and stuff like that. But I had a good time and, you know, I did have a couple of times where as a co I was ultra pissed by the end of the trip because like 
we'd be on a body of water that I knew very well. And I'd be telling the guy, Hey, we should really try this here. And he'd be like, no, 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 I got a plan, you know? And then we'd end up on the other side of the lake where no fish were caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or I'd get, I'd get back of the boat. You know what I mean? Where he, I'd find fish back there and then all of a sudden the, I'm looking at open water and he's hitting the fish that I was, that I was on, you know? Um, so, so that was a little frustrating, but it helped me kind of learn, you know, tackle management and, and really condensing the offering I brought with me. Uh, I learned how to fish fast being on the back of the boat, <laughs> you know, um, uh, cause depending on who you're fishing with and who's running that trolling motor, you, you gotta learn to adapt pretty quick. Uh, so it, it was very beneficial in a lot of ways. Yeah. I would have loved the control and all that, but you know, when I found kayak fishing, that's, that's kind of where that happened. But, you know, all, all these different stories and these different things that happen to you in your life shapes you as an angler going from salt oh, yeah. water to being a back to be in the back of the boat where you don't get to make the decisions. You have to fish the water in front of you and you get to learn and develop and grow. And that gets to, you know, where we are in the present day now that you're fishing, you know, KBF. And then we had this really it was a fascinating event this weekend because you had the Potomac team series, which is some of the best boating sticks on the planet. Um, right. on Saturday, I think you had a battle of the border series. I don't know if it went on or not because of the weather that goes, that goes out of a quiet on Sunday. There's a ton of pressure is my point this weekend yeah. D- going into this. And we really, I really like <clears throat> to examine the mental side of things. Did you just plan on the pressure being an issue? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, any of the, the bigger bodies of water and especially in like Maryland and Virginia, this re- this particular area, there's not a ton of places where there's a lot of tournaments that happen consistently. Tide of Potomac happens to be one of them. So I'm, you know, I'm used to seeing that pressure anytime and every time I'm out there, unless I'm fishing some little crazy, you know, arm of a, of a creek or some, you know, little back thing. Uh, I'm used to having bass boats come up on me and try to, you know, sit on my fish and do crazy things like that or, you know, happen to hurry to a spot because you see three other people beelining it there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, so I'm used to that, man. Um, I, I travel nationally. I fish the Hobies and, and, and the, the bass, uh, bass nation events, uh, bass master events and, uh, you know, KBF here and there depends, you know, but, um, I'm used to fishing highly pressured, you know, uh, lakes, you know, ones that have multiple tournaments going on at the same time. So it's nothing new. So this is a good point then I want to make. What places are more pressured than the Potomac river in the spring since you've been around the whole world? God, I'll tell you what, um, uh, probably Gunnersville is, is a big one. Like, uh, yeah, okay, that's a good the one. Amount, yeah the amount of tournaments and, and different marinas that are launching tournaments simultaneously on that lake on any given weekend, especially in the spring. Cause you have, you're coming off the ass end of the large mouth spawn, right? And what well, spring for us is already, they're already getting through their spawn. Uh, but then you have the small mouth spawn following directly after that. Like the small mouth spawn was the last couple of weeks down there. So there's always something cracking down there, man. Um, anywhere in the South really, but, but, you know, I, the first one that comes to mind is like a Gunnersville. I mean, that place sees an insane amount of pressure and puts out quality fish still. When you're traveling for these events, how do you, do you have a network of people that you stay with to help you break it down? Because again, as I got to fish my first couple of kayak tournaments last year, and no matter what you put on the back of it, it's not a 250. And so you can't cover the whole lake like Milliken does. And so you, you right. do have to factor that stuff in there to your approach. Um, so how do you go about doing that? Are you, is it just you or do you travel with a group of friends? No, nah, I've got a couple of squads. Uh, I've got my, my ship house squad, as we call ourselves. It's a, a group of people from like the first KBF national championship. We've got guys from California, Tennessee, Florida, Alabama. Like I think there's like 12 or 14 of us total um, from all over the country. And uh, we usually get a house together. Um, that crew has kind of evolved over the last couple of years, you know, based on people's responsibilities and stuff like that. Uh, and then I've got my local guys I'll travel with, you know, like, like Alex Fiocla, Matt Campbell, uh, you know, Trey, all those huge guys. Shout out to Alex, um, uh, yeah. Oh dude, huge shout out to Alex. That's one of my best friends, man. I love that dude. But, uh, but yeah, man, I mean, it, you know, everybody's still competitive. You know, it's just one of those things where your best friend's off the water and on the water, you're focused, you know, um, during practice, we'll practice together or, you know, we'll, we'll say, Hey, yeah, this part of the, the lake is fishing tough or, you know, maybe this bait's working. 
Um, but we're also trying to keep that competitive edge. So, you know, we don't, we don't jump too deep into any of that. But it, it does help, you know, um, there, there was, you know, on the water, there used to be a lot of communication, not with us, but uh, we know of people that would, you know, like, I'll give you an example. We were fishing, uh, uh, it was like a KBF regional championship up on Lake Erie, uh, a few years back. And myself and two other anglers, three other anglers were sitting out on this particular, it was the end of some riprap and it was just this perfect storm. And these smallies would come through in these giant schools and just wolf pack 18 to 20 inch smallies, just like nonstop for 30 minutes. You'd just be hooking into them. And, um, and we were, we were mixing up between those and, and large mouth where we were. Well, every time one of us would post another fish, we were all sitting in like the top five, I think we'd post fish. All of a sudden you'd see somebody with their little hand up on their little Bluetooth, you know, headphones or whatever. And next thing you know, we'd see like three more kayaks coming over. And I mean, it used to be, they used to call the Bluetooth mafia, <laughs> but like that, we would have to position our boats to protect the area we were fishing. It was crazy. Um, so, you know, I've, I've always been anti, you know, the team fishing that some, some people do, uh, for a competitive advantage at the end of the day, dude, it's me against the fish. I don't, I don't, I don't mind helping my friends out prior to the tournament starting, but once it starts, dude, don't, don't ask me. <laughs> I ain't the one, you know? That that is such an interesting topic uh, when you talk about information and, and how you gather it and how <coughs> things work around. Because in, in the in the tournament fishing world, regardless whether it's electric motor, kayak, bass boat, no one can truly have success on the trail. I believe if you're completely in a vacuum by yourself, um, it's just too much water. Right. And an interview that really hit that for me, I did with a with a local down in Florida. He said, like, if you have the, all the Harris Chain lakes you can't in two or three days of practice fish every lake. And so if you have a house of friends just to narrow it down to like one lake, he said, that's a heck of an advantage. And, and, and that opened my eyes to like the correct information to get is it's just putting you in the right ballpark of the lake. That way you could run your pattern. And I think this is what gets a lot yeah. of youth and high school anglers in trouble is they want to know the dock, the bait, the lure, and that's too granular. You don't want to be that granular because you're fishing other people's fish and you'll never do that correctly. You can't be that other person. Right. You get narrowly focused. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but no, I think it's always fascinating to get everyone's perspective on that. Now, going to this Potomac tournament, um, wh what were your thought process going into it? Uh, man, I was excited. Uh, last year, when this event came around, um, I went out onto Belmont Bay. There was, at, at, at that particular event, it was like the only grass on the river, uh, close by at least. So, you know, we had found some amazing fish on this, this long bank, um, in pre-fishing and, you know, on tournament day, it was like, I could, I could spit and probably hit the next boat. You know what I mean? It was ridiculous. Uh, and then I got COVID that day. I don't oh, know how, cause I didn't, I wasn't around on a damn person, but, uh, I, I went home and I felt like death and I couldn't walk. I couldn't get out. I couldn't even get up. Like it was horrible. And, uh, so I had to I had to bow out a day two because I, I could not even function. Um, but historically, I do really well on the Potomac. I got second in the Maryland State Championship. I've, I've won some of our club events down there. Um, I enjoy it, man. I, I like the title Potomac. It's, it's different every time you fish it, you know. Um, so I got really excited when I heard this was coming, and it was coming a little bit later. Um, you know, the I, I still think there's a ton of pre-spawn fish out there. Like not even close to spawning yet, especially with the, the weird cold streaks that keep coming. So, guys, I don't think I don't know if we mentioned this in the pod, uh, podcast or not. This may have been pre-recording, but um, yeah, we bumped into each other. I had a uh, tournament for the Antietam Bass Masters. I couldn't fish the NVKBA tournament because I had engagements with the wife, and I had to pick, <laughs> so I made her happy. So I couldn't fish Saturday. Right. So I fished Antietam on Sunday, and I and I bumped into you. Um, and what was interesting about that whole event was it was a little bit later on in the year and i didn't catch a single fish with a bloody tail none in oh, practice or the tournament and it just and but that's what's so interesting so like i right. thought they would all be bloody so that kind of gets to your point that there was still a right. lot of pre-spawn fish oh absolutely dude i i mean i had already kind of gathered that when we were pre-fishing back in the back uh, back on pohick because 
you know, um, I was catching some really good fish and they were chunky and there was nothing, no markings on them. And the runs I was catching, there was nothing, there was no, no markings on anybody that would indicate I, they were, had already spawned. Uh, and they were all fat. And then, you know, during the tournament, uh, well, day two, um, I started coming across a few that had bloody tails, you know, and then I'd, I'd, I'd hook, you know, a decent fish that, um, would follow up right behind where I caught them with the bloody tail. So <laughs> it was, it was interesting, man. It was something about that rain that really messed it up. And, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get in, we'll get into that when we get into it. But, um, so Saturday, you know, you get there, you make your decisions, like just walk us through the day. On Saturday. Um, yes, the Saturday was, uh, I was excited, man. I got there to the ramp. I was the very first person there. Um, I think like six or seven of us launched from there in Pohick. And I mean, it wasn't like your typical national level tournament. Um, you know, it was time for, for everybody to launch and everybody was just kind of like looking at each other, chilling, you know, messing with their tackle or whatever. And then, you know, uh, I mean, it got almost to lines in time and everybody started pushing off and it's like, all right, good luck y'all. It was, it, it had that real small club feel to it. Um, you know, when you fish the national events, everybody's like, oh, they're, as soon as that timer goes off, they're boom, 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 they're gone, you know? Um, but, but this was different, man. Everybody was just kind of chilling out on the bank and ready for the day to start. So it started super positive. Um, nice overcast skies. We were, we were initially supposed to get a ton of rain and we didn't. So, you know, during the tournament. So that was, that was a blessing. Um, but as we made it back to our spot, man, I mean, it was like, it was like fishing, you know, the Susquehanna or something. I mean, the, 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 the skinny stuff was really blown out and moving. Um, and so it was, it was a bit challenging. Like I said, I caught a couple of okay fish in the morning and then it died off. I uh, wasn't getting anything. Uh, you know, I decided to make that, make a run out across the entire public bay to the other side and fish some stretches that, I, that I knew would produce fish caught or lost a good one and then i had another guy slide in front of me it, you know and start fishing and lands like a 18 or 19 i said well okay now now i got to go around exactly where i had planned on fishing you know uh so it kind of it kind of messed me up a bit um i was sitting on four fish at like one o'clock i think um, wow and I went, wow yeah, yeah 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 i mean i had caught i caught a bunch of little uh shorts but nothing that i could score you know and i went back in the back and uh Scylla was back, you know, where, where we started. She, she didn't have a great day and all of a sudden she was lighting them up. And, uh, I said, okay, well, maybe they're turning back on back here. And, and so I, I went to work and, uh, ended up cracking my fifth fish. Um, ended up with like 76 inches, I think, 76 and a half, something like that. Uh, and, and that just kind of ended the day for me, man. Um, I burned through two 915 watt torpedo batteries in the day. That's how much I was running around. Uh, <laughs> so, just to put in perspective, one battery, one battery should usually last you a whole day, you know? So, but so you get back, you get to re reset and you get to be alone with your thoughts and in multi-day tournaments, which is basically what it is. It, it's fantastic because you have that alone time where the voices are in your head. And, and, and so before we get to yeah. that point, I, I guess when you chose Belmont or, or Pohick Bay, how much of it was yeah. you liked what you saw there versus you thought there would be less pressure from other kayaks was it 50 50 or was it, it was more both. it was both you know it was both um you know like i like i said you know we were talking before um when we did that expo at jake's and i had multiple people who knew who i was knew me and but but not like we're not people who go fishing all the time you know but they've seen me in tournaments they've seen me do well they're like you're going to your spots in 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 uh Mad woman i was like <laughs> you know like nah no nah, i'm not like absolutely not you know go have it um, you know, so it was it, part of it was frustration just because it's like, you know, has it gotten to that point where people snipe your spots and then they try to be considerate by asking if you're going to fish them? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. So it was, a, it was part, that was a big part of it. And then it was also the success, the success that I had in pre-fishing there. Um, you know, and I, I laid out a game plan. I, I like to do this for a two day tournament, especially if it's two single day tournaments back to back. Uh, I'll get a game plan up prior to the tournament as to like what I'm going to do day one and day two, um, kind of run through it in my head. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, think about bait selections, what, what to kind of have on my, like my little quick response box that I keep in my kayak, you know, um, 
if certain techniques don't work and that type of stuff. Um, so I planned out, you know, I was going to go to Pohik on day one. And then uh, regardless of how I, how Pohik fished on day one, even if I won day one, I was going to go to Mad Woman on day two, but I was going to do something different than what I traditionally do there. Now, if you killed it day one, would you still commit to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so here's the thing, right? I've learned this. This is for myself, at least, uh, tournament fishing, especially in the kayaks all these years. You know, you, if you make a decision, stick to it. Don't second guess yourself, right? Um, I've done that and, you know, uh, I've gone to, I've fished tournaments and I was like, I know the fish are going to be here because this, this and this. Find something great in practice, this, this and this. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm going to go fish that. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going to, you know, change places by 11 o'clock. If I don't stick to that plan and I just keep grinding it out, then I end up, you know, mad at myself, right? Or, you know, head tripping myself like, God, I should have done it. And, and, and if, you know, kayak fishing, a big part of it is a mental game. And so if you're constantly head tripping or second guessing yourself or like, Oh, I should have thrown this or, Oh, I mean, I'll throw this. You start fishing faster. Uh, you start fishing out of your comfort zone and then it becomes a lot more like work, which adds stress. Um, for me, you know, I, I've done that a lot and, uh, and I've learned from it. I've tried to at least, um, you know, this real simple kind of small example of that. Actually, I, I was watching Alex on your show uh, last week and it's something that I used to do and I stopped doing. He mentioned how, you know, he'll have uh, an entire limit before he uploads fish. And it's not that he's sandbagging, but he doesn't want to, you know, add to the pressure of it, right? And uh, so I consciously, going into this weekend, said, you know what? I'm not going to upload any fish. Um, I just, I'm just going to go fish. And I'm going to catch the hell out of them. And then I'm going to upload them later. Um, and that would force me to not look at the leaderboard, which applies mm. additional stress when you see somebody with, you know, 90 inches already by like 10 a.m. Like, you're... you're it puts you in a spin out or it can. And, um, I refuse to let that happen to me this weekend. So, you know, it was a very conscious decision, just like, you know, day one, I'm fishing here, day two, I'm fishing there. You know what I mean? Um, and I stuck to it. Yeah. That's so fascinating that they give you that option. Um, that, I mean, that's one thing I, I did fall in love with, with major league fishing the first couple of years where they forced you to hear the leaderboard just to watch those suckers sweat balls. It's just right. like, Hey, if all, you haven't caught a fish yet, you kind of suck. What are you going to do next? It's like, right. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, drama sells, you know, drama sells and the suspense and anxiety, it all sells, right? Because now it's, you're seeing real human emotions coming through and these people that you're idolizing or that you follow. Um, and it helps you become more connected to that. Well, that's so why we watch all, all sports, right? It's the perfect yeah. TV drama because it's happening in real time. Absolutely, makes it a lot more relatable. You're going into you're going into the second tournament or sec second day, and yeah. it decides to open up like an act of God. What uh, right. what happened? So, I uh, you know after day one or at the end of day one, actually I was still at awards. I I was calling Smallwood to make sure they would be open because I wanted to try to fish a different area. And, uh, and I, guys, I don't think we mentioned that. Um, sorry to cut you off, but I don't think, I think we were, uh, we weren't recording yet, but Smallwood state park, uh, wasn't open on Saturday because I think they had a triathlon or they had some event that Smallwood state park was shut down. Yeah. So, so in my head, you know, I was thinking, I can go fish, you know, history, right? Fishing history on the Potomac isn't always a great thing because it changes daily, you know? Um, but I can go fish history and I know areas where fish traditionally stack up or, you know, where, where I'll find them, uh, and deal with the crowds. Or I can go try this, you know, spot B that, you know, I fished. I, the last history of me fishing there has been a few years ago, but I know, I know what it yields this time of year, you know? And, um, so I made that conscious decision to, to go there. And actually I left my house. I got probably about 30 minutes into my drive and realized I left both my torpedo batteries and my fish finder battery charging in my garage. Oh my God. Yeah. So I had to it's run dark. back home. Yeah. I mean, and, and I switched to a, a paddle kayak this year, uh, the Jackson Kusa X. And so I needed my motor to get where I wanted to fish, you know? Uh, anyway, so. Finally got there. Uh, I think I launched me and another angler, uh, Carl Wynn. I ran into him at the, uh, at the, the launch ramp. We both launched right at lines in, I think. Um, 
and I get to my first spot, and as soon as I get there, boom, the first big, you know, crackle and lightning strike, uh, lightning and thunder happen. And I say, well, damn, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I get on the bank for a little bit and, and wait it out, and then I don't hear nothing else. I get to fishing, and I hook into a monster. And I'm telling you, uh, if it wasn't bigger than my big fish of the tournament, I'm lying. Like, it was a massive fish. Um, and I was trying to contain myself because one, it's dumping rain and I don't want the fish to come unpinned. And my, I have a buddy of mine that I know is fishing just probably 200 yards away and he has his back to me and I don't want him to see me fishing, let alone catching this massive fish. Right. So I'm trying to keep it down and it gets about five feet from the boat and jumps and my bait comes flying past my face. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So holding in all that emotion, right, without going, ah, screaming, mm-hmm. because I just lost, you know, which was a donkey. Um, and then right after that, the we had two more, uh, you know, strikes come in, and um, that weather system got hot and heavy. I mean, dude, it was, I couldn't see five feet in front of my kayak for a minute there, you know. Uh, but I sat on, I sat up on the bank again. I, I, you know, there was no houses or anything to get cover with, so I was like, all right, let me get in this pile of, giant lightning rods with trees and just sit here <laughs> um you know i've seen i've seen lightning strike on on the potomac actually down on the water when we're running you know in a bass boat trying to get back um so you know i i, I was hoping that it would you know not hit me dude, <laughs> and i it, just it i got prayed spo- there it got spo- it got oh, gnarly <laughs> dude Dude, I was like trying, I was looking at my phone, looking through my email and everything, trying to see if the tournament directors were going to cancel it or postpone or anything like that. And I just see a message saying, hey, get to safety. And then when it's clear, get to fishing again, you know? And I said, well, I said, all right, then game on. Yeah, because uh, like I was nervous there for a while. Like I was about to bag the day because it was, it's not worth your life. Yeah, no, exactly. And that, and that's what I was telling myself. I'm like, it ain't worth it. ain't worth it. I'm like, I went about halfway back to the launch. Um, that's where I actually hooked into that big, that giant that I lost. Um, I was heading back to launch and I fished, I was fishing a cove, you know, like two coves before the launch. And, uh, I was like, yeah, it ain't worth it. And then when, when I saw, I pulled up, you know, my weather app and I'm looking at the storm coming through and I'm like, Oh, it's about gone. And I'm looking at the sky. It's like kind of clearing up. It's still raining, but it's, you know, you see that big push that was what was happening with the thunder and lightning go, go away. I said, all right, well, I guess I'm gonna get back to it. Um, I fished that area for a little bit longer and, and it didn't yield anything, but I think one small, small fish. Um, oh, pause. Actually, rewind. Um, I was, I was this close to leaving for a minute. After those last two lightning strikes, I did, uh, I did say, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to go ahead and go home. Like I had, I'd already had water get inside my, my rain gear and down, down, you know, my back. And I was just, it was like cold and, you know, windy and raining and the, the waves and everything else. And I was like, dude, I'm not dealing with this. This is, this is too much, man. Um, and so I started to go back and I, I hooked into it 18 and three quarters. And I said, okay, never mind. Yeah, I told myself, never mind. I'm going to go ahead and stay. <laughs> uh, and then, then I hooked into like a 16 or a 15 and three quarters, something like that. And I said, ah, okay, well, I, I don't think this is the area I want to fish today. Um, so I moved out and I, I went to some other areas that I thought would, you know, it was a good combination of uh, hard bottom and, and some grass and, and just, you know, I saw I would see bait activity off in the distance and it was all kind of tying together for me. Um, I get to the next spot and I lose two more giants. Again, at least one of them was at least the same size and the other one was bigger than my big fish. So I lost three giants in a matter of 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, the, the last two were on back to back casts in different areas. I, I, I totally didn't cast right back at the fish I lost and I cast it way over here and same thing. I mean, it was just the perfect storm and the perfect like frustration. Like I'm completely over this. I'm done. Like, you know, um, I switched, I, I actually switched rods and, and baits at that point. So I was like, it's either the hooks are dull on this or I'm not getting the right hook set or something's happening. So I was like troubleshooting in my head and instead of getting spun out on it and keeping, you know, torturing myself by losing fish off this bait uh, i switched over to like my tried and true combination um that catches fish anywhere and went to work uh started catching some okay fish what, what, what was the big switch and we're pre-recording right now so we can always blurt this out was it yeah, like a, did awesome. you go from a treble hook to a straight normal hook or was it no i actually i went from a, a real small well i went from like a crankbait 
um, to uh, uh, XRK50 and XRK25 Excalibur. Oh. Um, they're discontinued now. Pradco uh, rebranded them with Booyah as their, their one knocker and their hard knocker now. Uh, lip, lip, lipless cranks, but I have um, a ton of them. yo, yeah. I, I, if you look at the, <laughs> if you look on Facebook, there's the Excalibur uh, buy, sell, and trade page. That's my page, actually. Dude, um, it's so yeah. crazy. No one likes throwing treble hooks on the Potomac anymore. Oh. A lot of people are just chatterbait, swim bait, and it's like yeah. you know, guys, there are these things that actually still work. Yeah. Well, so ironically enough, uh, I've had some of my most successful days throwing a jackhammer on the Potomac. Um, but just like any other bait, you know, um, I, I mean, I know it still works. It works great. I still throw the hell out of it, but, yeah. uh, I also know the fish get tired of seeing the same thing over and over. And, and I've kind of noticed that same trend you're talking about where people are kind of getting away from throwing the traps and the things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's my baby. That's my favorite bait of all time. And, and, and to me, it's also, your your I consider hookup percentage is if you hook the fish, and when I'm throwing yeah. a crankbait or a lipless on the river, I in my gut feel like I have I hook more fish than a chatterbait because I'm dealing with trebs. Those fish that just swipe at it, if they swipe yeah. at your chatterbait and they don't get that hook, you you don't got them. But with a lipless or a crankbait, right. you still got a chance that you might get one hook in them. Yeah, yeah. Um. I don't know, dude. It's a love hate relationship with me and treble hooks. Sometimes, uh, yeah. dude, like sometimes you just can't keep them pinned. I, I've, I've gone through, you know, so many variations of different brands and styles of treble hooks to find what I like. Um, but, but yeah, dude, I mean, I, I've caught all of them, all but one of my biggest fish have all been on, you know, uh, that the XRK series baits. I mean, you know, it, it's one of the most money baits there ever was, and 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 they discontinued it, which was insane to me. But do you uh, go braid? So, no, no. I throw. The only thing you ever find on any of my reels is between eight and twelve pound fluorocarbon, P line tactical fluorocarbon. Um, you will see my swim bait rod has seventeen pound on it and fifteen pound, depending on the size of the baits I'm throwing. Um, the only other thing you ever find on a reel of mine would be 20 pound mono. And that's again on a swim bait rod, but the majority of the time I'm fishing eight to 12 pound fluorocarbon, pure fluorocarbon. I don't, I don't like braid. I don't like doing all the little extra knots to tie them together and all that craziness. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Why? Uh, you know, I, I grew up fishing all mono, right. And you know, um, uh, when I first started f- freshwater fishing with my stepdad, we do a lot of trout fishing and fish a lot of light line, you know, like four pound test, two pound test, fishing for crappie and trout. And then I wouldn't change the gear out and I'd fish for bass with it too, you know? Um, so I always kind of just got used to using the lighter lines. Um, and then I discovered fluorocarbon and I was like, damn, I can get stronger line with the, the same diameter as, you know, this lighter stuff. Um, and I just liked it. You know, there wasn't, you didn't have the stretch like you'd have with the mono. Um, which took some getting used to, but once I started using it, I just didn't like using anything else anymore. Hmm. That's interesting. That's fascinating. Wow. It might, it might be dis, you know, disadvantageous in certain scenarios for me, I'm sure, but I, I don't lose a lot of fish. I don't break a lot of fish off. I mean, um, you know, uh, MAKBF season opener last season we did on the upper bay. Uh, I landed a 31 and a half, 32 inch snakehead. Uh, on eight pound uh, fluoro on my spinning rod, my finesse setup with a shaky hit. So Jesus, that's what that's, we do. You, wow, you know, holy crap, man! I mean, I do. Uh, a CJSB was there with me. He saw the whole thing. I got pictures of it, man. It's like it's got a head like a pit bull, dude. It's like I mean, this wow. massive head and gut. But um, that's wow. a good fish. That's so freaking cool. Yeah, it, it's. I'm glad you said that because I really do feel like lipless baits and crankbaits get such a bad rap that no one throws them. And I get oh, it, yeah. like. The, the chatterbait does, it is king for a lot of ways, but like everyone thinks like if you hook anything with a lipless bait, you're going to lose it immediately. And that's just bullshit. You're not, it, that's no. you, your, your system is just not correct with it. Yeah, no, agreed. I actually, so, so little background here. Um, when I started using bait casters for the first time and really started getting into like getting more complex with my setups rather than just a bunch of spinning setups, um, 
I, I went out and, and Ugly Stick has, uh, they have this series of rods. They only sell them at Walmart. They're called Custom Pros. They have core candles and they're black and blue. And when I first started fishing competitively in kayaks, that's what I used to throw. Hmm. And they were, they were, um, you know, that they were a lot heavier than, than my eye rods, <laughs> obviously. But, but for me, I was like, this is like, this is like a, a nicer fishing rod, right? And they were super cheap. They were like 25, 30 bucks, I think. Um, but I got used to – where was I going with this, man? Like I got used to being able to fish like multiple techniques and styles with the one kind of rod. And then when mm. I re- – when I start – you know, and so like throwing like the treble bait, uh, you know, lipless, um, I knew what I wanted to feel in the rod when I was retrieving it, right, when I was pulsing it or when I was just reeling back and burning it, when I was doing all these things, I knew how I wanted to feel in my hands because you could feel the different vibrations on your hand if you are if you have contact with the rod playing. And when I changed over and started fishing with better fishing rods, I, I got into uh, to eye rods and I felt, I dude, like every vibration or knock on my bait or anything was amplified. And I was like, oh, my God, like a whole new world. Like it was like, dude, it was a beautiful thing. And so, you know, I, I never understood technique specific rods up until that point, really. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew it, knew about it. And I was like, ah, like, I'm good, dude. I got this medium heavy action that I'm just going to use for everything. Right. Or this medium action that I'll use for everything else. And that was it. Um, but then I get to start. I, I, I start just stacking up my rods with I rod and and. um I discovered a whole new world. Like it literally was very technique specific. Uh, I found some variations that I liked with it, but you know, uh, I have, it's a medium heavy, medium heavy crusher series rod, seven foot three. Um, I found that it's the best jackhammer rod I've ever laid hands on. And I've tried the Dobbins and the Phoenixes and all the, you know, um, and it just, it feels money, dude. And I've got a, everybody around here using it too, cause it's so damn good. But what I discovered was, it works on all vibrating baits, not just vibrating jigs. So I started, I started messing around with throwing my Excaliburs with it. And I'll tell you what, I will never, ever, 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 ever. And I'm probably jinxing myself saying this, but I've never had a fish come off of one of my Excaliburs throwing it with that rod. Hmm. Not once. Um, Fascinating. That's really cool. It's, dude, it's, it's, I don't know, man. It's, it, maybe it's just a confidence thing, but it's, it's the great combination of like soft tip, but still a great backbone the amount of sensitivity that vibration so you know like when you're pulsing it and you feel like you hit that grass and you have to jerk it uh, you kind of just feel every little in your fingertips you know to the point where your hands go numb because you're feeling so much of the vibration um but i I think that that's really important too so like you know uh i had i had that 21 that 21 and a quarter hit right it choked it and i knew it choked it because it felt almost like you felt the immediate strike where like the rod just jerked down but then it almost felt like dragging a wet towel for a second, you know, because you got oh. them in their, in their throat and they're like, oh, you know what I mean? Um, they respond differently and you can feel that in the rod. And I think that that is the part that I really dig about it, you know? Dude, that is epic. No, I, I know exactly what that feeling is like. It's freaking it's freaking game on. But yeah. And and then cr- trying, I, I and I know we always go on tangents here on this show. That's what we're all about. But and we, and we segue bad. back into <laughs> no, no, dude. This is this is what we do here. We we are the long form here. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, I know with liplets because I throw a ton of them. Um, I mean, hell, I somehow knock on wood. I got I got fifth place in my tournament throwing crankbaits. Um, I can't think. Did I catch one on liplets? No, I didn't. But. I didn't lose any fish, but I've had days out right. there when for some reason I just, they throw it. I don't know why the hell they do it. It makes no sense. I put fresh hooks on there, everything. You made a switch and was that purely just mentally? Was that a pure mental thing just to reset? Yeah, it was a couple things. It was, it was really the mental thing. Cause I, I promised myself, you know, um, I'm not going to let anything spin me out during this tournament. You know what I mean? Um, again, it's a very mental thing. I thought, you know, everybody has personal stuff going on. I've had a lot going on. Uh, I'm always a very busy person, so stress levels aren't always great, (laughs) but, um, I've been trying to make conscious decisions to improve my, my headspace, if that makes sense. And Mm -hmm. one of those was like, I'm going to change rods. I'm going to change baits. I'm going to go to my confidence combination. And, you know, especially this time of year, it works and I'm going to throw the hell out of it. And either I'm going to do really well with it, or I'm going to go down swinging or slinging. (laughs) And, and, you know, and that's, that's what it was going to be. 
and um i i tied a couple different variants you know i had a 25 on on one rod uh i have three of the crushers that exact crusher rod that's how much i love it uh and so i had a shad pattern on one uh i had you know uh my rayburn red 50 on one and i had a rayburn red 25 on the other and um and that was that was the only thing i rotated through was basically switching to a different color for the remainder of the day that's so big is that color change the color change and vibration like the two yeah. things with lipless you can adjust so much right dude i mean you absolutely killed it with this tournament you got you got second place um that's got to put you good in the points it's got to make you feel good going to the next event yeah man um it does it does i don't know that i'll be fishing any other kbfs this year i may but um i'm having a neck surgery next month it's gonna put me out for like three weeks oh my god and, what happened uh it's old army injury i i'm getting some discs fused in the neck uh, uh no biggie uh, yeah uh, i already have titanium in my spine so i'm i mean it's just one more thing but uh you know, it is what it is, but that's going to take me out for about three weeks. Uh, I'm not going to travel as much nationally this season because of that and a new job and some other business opportunities I've got going on. But um, I'm only going to miss one MAKBF event. And then uh, I think the next one will be on like the Delaware River or something like that. Um, is that place even worth fishing? Probably not. I don't know. I heard it and I was like, ah. And then somebody was talking. So I'm like, I got to go beat them. We have guaranteed money now. And, you know? So new, new, I like I like it because it's fishing in a new place and I've never fished it, so it's something to learn really fast um, and study up on and and kind of find out some cool new knowledge about a place I've never touched. I don't know. I think it's kind of dope. You just made me. Uh, you you told me actually. This just dawned a memory to remind you to tell me a story about Alex. Bro, yes. All right. So <laughs> Alex, like I said, Alex is one of my best friends, dude. He's he's such good people. Um, him, Matt Campbell, you know, Trey Leach, uh, there's a whole bunch of guys locally that Aaron White, they, they just kind of get it. It's not something that's really could totally be put into words or quantifiable, but they understand kind of bigger picture life and, you know, the necessity of fishing, uh, as, as a very major component in that, but they understand people and, and they're all very compassionate people. Um, but Alex and I, you know, He's, he's even more well known for doing well in the Potomac than I am. He's, he's, he's done really, really well, uh, in years past and, and at every level with us. And we're fishing, uh, the state championship. Actually, I got second right there, uh, September of 2020. Um, but, uh, we're fishing it and I was sitting in second place. I did get second. Uh, but I was sitting in second place and I had big fish for the tournament. So, you know, as I'm heading back into the ramp, I lost track of Alex. He was kind of fishing close to where I was. Um, I lost track of him and I'm heading back to the ramp and I'm, you know, smoking and joking, as they say, cracking up, talking on the phone. And, you know, I'm like looking at the big fish, big fish and keep refreshing. It's almost time for the leaderboard to shut off. And then I see all of a sudden I see Alex has uh, like a 21 inch drop and it takes my big fish out of the lead. And I'm wow. like, you've got to be kidding me. It was like literally like a minute to fish or some nonsense. And he threw a frog and it just smashed it. Um, and so like, so I gave him kind of hell about it. I mean, I still got second that day and, and Dave Burt took first that day. And, but, you know, he, I, I give him hell about that all the time. Like, come on, man. Like, don't, don't do that last minute nonsense to me. So we're at, I get back to the ramp and I'm, I go up, I get my truck and I'm driving the truck back down to get my yak. And I see Alex walking up and he's like, dude, congratulations. I see you killed it. You had a great bag. And he like does a little fist bump through the window. And I'm like, yeah, man, did you get anything? Because I, I saw him in passing when I was out there. And he's like, dude, he goes, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but I got on the meanest spinnerbait bite. And I'm like, bro, shut the – I was like, you did not do it to me again. Don't do not do this, <laughs> right? Because I was – dude, I was messaging people like, hey, what was big bass before the, the thing shut off? Like, you know, 21 and a quarter is a big fish for the Potomac, but there's big ones out there. And so I was, you know, I was stressing. And, and then all of a sudden he swung in with like, he, he caught this crazy limit, right? And I was just like, dude, are you kidding me? Because I was thinking I won MAKBF, you know, like all these scenarios in that instant just were like, pow. And then he was like, nah, I'm just messing with you, bro. And, and he was like, dude, congrats. I love you, man. And that was like, that was such a cool moment, dude, because he got me for real. 
but uh but yeah we we go back and forth we rib each other quite a bit you know he's a former marine i'm a former army soldier so you know we've got that but also again you know we both kind of have that understanding of it you know that perspective uh that i think some people might lack so, yeah. this is something i've been meaning to ask some of our guests and you probably are the best one to ask about this i i ha i've born and raised in northern virginia i i grew up spent 13 years of, of my young life in Vienna before moving out a little bit further. It, is it <clears throat> all military people fish or is it just because of the area we're in? That's why there's so many people that you bump into that are in the military. In fact, I, 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 I've, I was always interested about that because when you go other places, you still see that a little bit, but here it's, it's thick with that. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it's just the close, close proximity of so many different bases and, you know, some of the bigger hospitals are out here. Um, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of veterans here now that, that, you know, no longer active duty because of, again, all of the different bases and, and from all the branches that are out here. Uh, so I think that it's just kind of that concentration. There is a, a, a huge population in the armed forces that fish, but I'd say it's a small percentage in, in contrast to the, the, the larger number, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause I've always been meaning to ask someone that cause it just seems like everyone I bump into is served. And I was like, well, maybe that's just because of where we live, but then it is. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes yeah. a lot I, more sense. I mean, you figure that we were at war for a lot of years too. And so, I mean, there's a lot more veterans. I mean, it's still, we only make up, I think, what is it like less than 1% of the population or something? I forget what it is, but, but still, I mean, the amount of veterans is, is pretty high at this point, you know, whether it was because of poor retention or just the wars are over, you know? But I, I would say, even let's just say let the, with got those numbers, if it's 1% of the population, but out of that 1%, I would say a majority of them fish. So I think of all the populations, they probably have the highest percentage that actually are outdoorsmen. Yeah, I don't, mm, maybe, maybe. I don't, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I try to think of it like from the perspective of all the different units I've been in and of a unit that's 150 people, maybe 10 of us fish, you know, if that. So I tried and that was a pretty consistent across every unit, every location I was in, even if I was in the heart of the best fishing, you know, in the area type of place, uh, like Fort Hood. Fort Hood has some amazing lakes by it uh, within, you know, a couple hour drive. Really? Uh, wow. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's central Texas. You're dead center in the te in Texas, dude. So like, you know, uh, I mean, granted, Texas is massive. So you I mean, it takes you 10 hours to, to get south to something real good. But um but you're, it's, you know, a couple hours from Dallas, Fort Worth area. So all the lakes that are up there, um, you know, Belton Lake right there in Stillhouse there in, you know, near Colleen where Fort Hood is, it's just loaded, man. You got to give me one story. Give me one, one, one story from, from those days. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I, I mean, I've got a lot of them. Um, all right. Yeah. So I had this, uh, well, I used, okay, so I was chemical. I was a chemical soldier in the army before I, I did that for the first half of my career and then satellite communications the second half. Um, but in, in my particular chemical unit that I was a part of, it was a, a chemical unit inside of a chemical battalion inside of a chemical brigade that was all co-located together on Fort Hood in one area. So we'd have these massive field problems, right, where <clears throat> several hundred people would be, I'd say like four or five hundred people would be in the field at and you know having like war games and like different strategic and tactical planning and you name it right and we were chemical so you know everything was with with that chemical twist using our gas masks in some way or something and um they used to have what was called mre bombs and they would basically it was like a heater for the mre and you'd put water in it and you you it would heat your food right but you could also put that same powder in like a bottle and pour water in and shake it up close the lid on tight and it's going to go boom very similar like if you put like mentos in a bottle and you close it like that explosion that would happen yeah um so we would do mre bombs but we would put uh tabasco sauce in them and it would be like ghetto C cs gas right like like yeah and so we would raid the other platoons uh talks at night and we'd we'd throw mre uh cs bombs in the in the entrances to their talks and then be like gas 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 and watch them come out struggling and coughing because they didn't have their gear with them and uh one time we went out there and ended up getting into it with one of the platoon sergeants and i was like a private at the time 
And uh, he used to have this thing where, you know, if you had if you had beef with somebody in the platoon, it didn't matter their rank, you could sit there and, and throw down, right? And as long as there was, there was no strikes to the face and no, you know, no, no intentional strikes to the face was pretty much the only thing, right? And um, so I got called out by one of the platoon sergeants. He's like, Evans, you know, I, I want your ass is what he said. And I'm like, bro, like, he was like this little Mexican dude with a really heavy accent. And I'm like, don't, don't ever say that again. And he's like, oh, you're being funny. And I'm like, absolutely. What's up? And so um, he was like 5'10", but he was like a little like cock diesel bodybuilder dude, you know. And um, we ended – it was like the longest fight of my life. I grew, I've fought all my life. And I, uh, I fought with this dude for like, I kid you not, 15 minutes straight. It was like we were rolling around, ending up in Constantine Wire, like uh, – having each other in every kind of choke punching each other in the ribs like just gnarly and it just kept going <laughs> and like and and the other platoon sergeants and, and and the other you know soldiers were like yo are we breaking this up and he's like absolutely not and i'm like nope definitely not and i mean dude we beat the brakes off each other that day and then we were done like he ended up becoming you know one of my favorite people in the world that was, <laughs> yeah i mean because that's the cause most one, dude story ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because cause one, like, he wasn't afraid of me, you know, and being a big dude, you already had that people, you know, assume that you're, you're going to beat him up or something, I guess. I don't, I don't know how to put it. I don't know. But, but a lot of the little guys want to challenge you too, you know? And he, he was like kind of that Napoleon complex, poke his chest out all the time, you know? And so it was just that perfect storm and we had to throw down, uh, especially after the, the MRE bombs kind of pissed him off because we, we got him in his whole platoon. But, um, but yeah, so he ended up, it, funny enough, he ended up being, uh, my squad leader and platoon sergeant not too far down the line. And, and, you know, we were good friends after that. So, you know, you, you got to test each other and then, then you can go to war with each other. Josh, I can't top that. That is awesome, dude. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And, and before, before we go here, link in the episode description, to everything we talk about, uh, we talked about tonight, Josh, uh, you want to give a shout out to any sponsors in particular? Yeah, man. Well, first I want to thank, uh, thank you for having me on. Dude, very appreciated. Um, pleasure getting to talk with you. Hope we get to chat and fish together sometime soon. Uh, I want to thank my wife, Rita, and my kids. They support this madness that that uh, I'm into. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny obsession. Uh, she won't let me try fly fishing still, but, you know, that's because I have too much gear, I guess. Um, but as far as sponsors go, uh, Jackson Kayak, I, I won't paddle or pedal or something different. Um, you know, it's it's as much consistency with you know the product as it is the customer service as it is just that family feeling that i you know it's hard to find especially in, in the industry like the fishing industry and kayak fishing industry uh so jackson kayak uh dakota lithium i rod again if you ever want to try that rod out let me know i'll put one in your hands and you will fall in love um p line uh malone auto racks yakima and bending branches uh all of which you know i would never associate myself with any brand that I don't believe in or use uh, religiously and, and actually use. Um, and, and all of them, you know, are, are companies run by amazing people and that are doing amazing things in kayak fishing. So very blessed to be, you know, supported by them, uh, sponsored by them. Last but not least, I do also want to bring up, uh, I'm not sponsored by Innovative Sportsman and Trey Leach, but um, that dude is a wizard with kayaks so mm -hmm. you know i always got to shout him out he's a good friend he's good people but he makes some insane stuff he helped me rig up you know my kusa x that you saw at the show um if you need anything done as far as rigging out your kayaks or customizing some stuff or getting motor mounts get with trey leach he's he's the one innovative sportsman josh thanks again i can't thank you enough for coming on the show and congrats on your really your really fantastic finish that's really got to put a good place going into the rest of the season again guys link in the episode description everything we talked about again please hit that like button it really helps us out in the youtube algorithm this is fishing the dmv we are the number one fishing show in the greater dmv metropolitan area we'll see, we might be talking but we're done here we'll see you next time bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.